What is up, everybody? How are you guys doing? Happy August. Man, I love August. It's such a special month for me. My husband and I, our anniversary is in August and we are coming up on three years. So yay, we have not killed each other yet. Hashtag relationship goals and fall is actually quickly approaching and oh, I love fall. It's my favorite season. Get to enjoy the crisp cool air, watch the leaves change color and snuggle up by the fire and you know drink pumpkin spice everything. Yeah, yes, I am that girl. I love pumpkin spice. So if you're not onto that bandwagon, just get over it and come on to the dark side and enjoy some pumpkin spice. So what else is there? For me, this week has been pretty busy and it's been hot as heck here in Nebraska. And today was actually kind of nice. It's actually raining right now, but earlier it was 85 degrees and I thought, okay, you know, it's been super hot. I'm going to take the motorcycle out for a ride. And so I did, but it was so hot, y'all. I came home drenched in sweat, begging for water. Like, I drank three bottles of water because I was just so thirsty. But it was fun. Other than that, my week has consisted of babysitting a little bit and doing some schoolwork and this. So, yeah. How's your week been? So, back to relationship goals or relationship stuff. Have you ever had that ex that you think is just a psycho? Or like you've called your ex a psycho or you know you've heard from your friends that their ex was psychotic. Well they probably weren't like in the psychological diagnosis sense. So guess what we're going to learn today? We're going to learn all about psychotic disorders. I am your host Katie Gonzalez and you're listening to What the Psychology. In the words of Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right. I hope you guys are ready to dive into this because I sure am. So psychotic disorders. So a lot of people, they recognize psychotic disorders by the most common and most severe, which is schizophrenia. Now, a lot of people, they do tend to confuse psychotic disorders with personality disorders. Some people mistaken schizophrenia for being like a multi-personality type of disorder, but it's not. And I'll explain the difference here. So psychotic disorders, it's having a break with reality. And so some of these mental health problems are chronic while others are short-lived. Now personality disorders, well, we're going to get into that in another episode, but The biggest difference between personality disorders and psychotic disorders is that personality disorders have to do with identity or identities and psychotic disorders have to do with reality or realities. That'll probably make more sense maybe once we go over this and then when we do have a personality and personality disorder episode, but that will be further down the line. So schizophrenia is one of the most severe chronic psychiatric disorders and and symptoms usually start between the ages of 16 and 30. So now they include positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Now I don't mean by positive as in happy-go-lucky and negative as in like pessimist. Positive symptoms have to do with things that happen or like active type of symptoms and negative symptoms have to do with things that are absent or decreased. You'll understand this when we dive into the two main types of schizophrenia here in a bit. Now symptoms that go along with all types of schizophrenia are disturbed perceptions, disorganized thinking and speech, and diminished and inappropriate emotions and actions. Now schizophrenia, only 1% of the U.S. population is diagnosed with this disorder. The onset usually occurs in late adolescence or early adulthood. And now the, uh, the onset is typically earlier and more severe in men than in women. So remember in episode one when we talked about phobias and um, we had a little point system competition of men versus women and we gave men a point because 
because phobias are more common in women. Well, now us ladies, we get a point because this is one that is, it's more common. I wouldn't even say more common. It's just more severe and in the onset is earlier in men. And we'll go over it a little bit later. But the earlier the onset of schizophrenia, usually it's harder to recover in a sense. So ladies, we get a point. I told you, man, there's going to be some things that are more common or more severe in you than us. The first type of schizophrenia is called chronic schizophrenia. And it's a process type of schizophrenia. And it usually shows negative symptoms. Now, this is what I mean by things are either absent or decreased. That means that things have been removed. So, for instance, there could be a re reduced facial expressions, decreased feelings of pleasure in the everyday trouble starting or continuing with activities or speaking very little. So it's an absence or decreased amount of things that happen, happen when it's negative symptoms. Chronic schizophrenia, as people age, the psychotic episodes, they tend to last longer and the recovery period is shorter. Now, the symptoms for chronic schizophrenia, they do usually appear by late adolescence or early adulthood. And I know I keep saying that, but with the next type, it's a little different. All right, so the next type of schizophrenia is called acute schizophrenia. This is the most displayed type of schizophrenia that you see in movies or in the media. And it's a reactive type of schizophrenia. And it shows positive symptoms. So for this, that pretty much means that the active symptoms, they reflect on an excess or distortion of normal thinking or behavior. So they have hallucinations, delusions, dysfunctional ways of thinking, and or movement disorders. Now hallucinations and delusions, they are two different things. All right, a lot of people kind of get them mixed up. So hallucinations, they are characterized by false sensory perception. Okay, Katie, long fancy words. What does that mean? So the typical hearing voices and or seeing things, those are hallucinations. Now delusions are characterized by false beliefs. So these are like completely bizarre or far-fetched ideas. And so it'll be something like God told me to do this or the Queen of England is trying to kill me or the government planted a chip in my arm and they're tracking every movement. You know, it's such, such bizarre and far-fetched ideas to the extreme where you would know something's wrong with this person. But they would also be showing other signs to where you would know they were completely bonkers, so to say. Now with acute schizophrenia, this is what I mean about the whole age thing. Acute schizophrenia, it can begin at any age, but it does frequently occur in a response to an emotional traumatic event and it has extended recovery periods. So what causes schizophrenia? Well, there are many causes and it can be a combination or it can be one thing or many different things. And the first one I want to talk about is the brain. Man, I love the brain. The brain is so interesting. It's so intricate and it's so beautiful and people think I'm weird <laughs> for saying that. But when I first started learning about psychology, when I was in my intro to psychology class, one of the first things we went over was the brain, which makes sense because, I mean, that's where everything really happens, right? And I just fell in love with that. I, I think it's like neuroscience. It's very interesting. And I've always loved to know the way that things work and why they work. So we're going to talk about brain chemistry here a little bit because it is important to know about when we're talking about not only this disorder, but many others that we're going to cover in this podcast. We've all heard about neurons. Neurons are pretty much the cells in your brain. They communicate, they talk to each other, they do what they're supposed to. Now in your brain, there are things called neurotransmitters. These are the messengers of the brain. They tell your brain you need to transmit this message, okay, neurotransmitter. Transmit me message. That's the easiest way to really understand it and describe it. In, in your brain, there are brain receptors. And what happens is these neurotransmitters come up to the brain receptors and they communicate. Your receptors are supposed to be regulated. The best way to really think about this is like a bouncer at a club. And your receptors is the bouncer 
and the neurotransmitters are the people trying to get into the club. And so the bouncer regulates the club by saying, okay, you're 21, you can come in. Hey, you have a fake ID, you're out of here. Or, you know, hey, it's COVID time and we're only allowed to have 30 people in the club so the rest of you have to leave or you have to wait in line to go in to the club until people leave. <laughs> I'm glad I could, in a weird sense, use that as an example because if COVID never happened, I probably would be scratching my head trying to think of another example for that. Neurotransmitters. For when it comes to schizophrenia, it can be caused by an excess number of dopamine responses. Now, what does that mean? So what that means is that the receptors of the brain are letting too many neurotransmitters in to communicate that dopamine is allowed. So it's pretty much the bouncer at the club is letting 60 people in when it's COVID time and we're only supposed to have 30 people in. We're supposed to only have 30 dopamine responses in the brain, but instead there's 60 in there. And so the chemistry of the brain, it puts everything out of whack. So this is important to know because when it comes to other disorders, the opposite can be led to those. Briefly, if we talk about depression, there is a sparity of usually serotonin. What that means is the bouncer at the club is not letting enough people in and they're not making money. We're supposed to have 30 people in the, well, we'll say it's not COVID time because yeah it's normal time and okay so if we go back to the club example this would be like the bouncer is standing there and the serotonin neurotransmitters are just hanging out and the bouncer's not letting everybody in but the club's not even full like they're not making any money so why aren't you letting the serotonin in so that can be a cause of depression so it would be the opposite of having an excess we're going to talk about medications later. That comes into play when it comes to regulating our brain receptors. Along with the brain and along with schizophrenia, not only can an excess number of dopamine responses be the cause of it, but it could also be an interaction with dopamine, serotonin, and glutamate, all of those neurotransmitters the way they interact can cause schizophrenia. You can also just have other abnormal brain activity and brain anatomy. There could be problems with several brain regions and their interconnections, or there could be low activity in the frontal lobe of the brain, which is pretty much the judgment center of the brain. And you could have like more rapid tissue loss, which could cause this as well. Next thing that could be a causation of schizophrenia is the prenatal environment and the risks that go with that. If there's low birth rate, a lack of oxygen during delivery, maternal prenatal nutrition, mid-pregnancy viral infection, so that could be the flu, that could be COVID, any, any other type of viral infection, the season of birth population, etc. All of those things put babies at risk for developing schizophrenia. Now do remember, don't be too concerned. We're going to go over like the warning signs here in a bit, but like I said, only 1% of the population is diagnosed with this disorder. The odds are 1 in 100. Speaking of that, Genetics do play a big risk here. Schizophrenia is influenced by genetics and the odds of people that do not have a parent with schizophrenia, it's one in a hundred, right? However, if you have a family member that has had it, your chances are now one in ten. That genetic factor can really influence whether you could develop schizophrenia or not. Now there's also epigenetic factors which influence the gene expression. That's a very long and very fancy sentence, isn't it? Sounds beautiful and sounds complicated. But in easy terms, the environment influences genetics, which is the good old nature versus nurture debate. But a lot of times we actually see nature and nurture interact and that can cause these things. What this is saying is you may have that genetic factor, but your environment can either help schizophrenia develop or it, if you have a positive home life, positive environment, then you may not develop it. It, re it really depends. Sometimes like your chances increase by genetics if you already have a family member who has it. If you have a really crappy home environment, then your chances just increased even more. Now, what are the warning signs? So, social withdrawal or other abnormal behavior. My notes, it says a mother with severe and long-lasting schizophrenia, but earlier it said if one, if a family member has it, 
But I guess if it's so closely related to it being a, your maternal side, then that's kind of a warning sign. And a little off topic here, the show Chrono Minds, if you watch that show, Dr. Spencer Reed, his mom has schizophrenia. That's the whole reason why he got into behavioral health and got into psychology and works for the FBI in the show. And I don't know if he was ever diagnosed with it like in the show. Because I, I, it's been a while since I've actually watched it. But I know that's... I think one of his concerns, looking at it, that he would develop it or something. Because he is pretty young in that show. Anyways, <laughs> like I said earlier, birth complications or separation from parents. Disruptive or withdrawn behavior. Emotion unpredictability. Poor peer relations and solo play. And of course, childhood physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Notice this does say physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. It can be any of the three. Now, when it comes to all disorders and not just schizophrenia, these symptoms, they represent a sharp break from normal experience, or they can. Well, other symptoms, they differ from normal experience primarily in their degree, intensity, and duration. Biological, cognitive, and social factors, they all contribute to the development of a disorder. I should say and or, because it can be all three, it can be one, it can be two, but usually it's a good combo of the three. Now, while a growing number of people are being diagnosed with disorders, and honestly, I think that's just because the stigma about mental health is starting to change for the better where more people are seeking help so I think that's probably why more people are being diagnosed. There is a reason for optimism because now we have therapy like medication and we have different type of treatments. There's cognitive behavioral treatments, there's strictly cognitive or strictly behavioral and usually it's a combination of all of them. Now I do want to talk about treatment a little bit because before we're going to dive into some heavy cases here. Now when we were talking about the neurotransmitters earlier, what medications do, it tries to regulate the brain. It tries to take that abnormal chemistry that is happening in the brain and make it to where it's more regulated. So like in schizophrenia, it's that excess amount of dopamine responses. So what typically happens when you take a antipsychotic medication, it pretty much regulates the bouncer at the club. <laughs> So now instead of an excess amount of dopamine neurotransmitters getting into the club, now this drug is taken to, to bring in an extra bouncer to be like, okay, yeah, not all these people can come in. Not all of these dopamine transmitters need to be let in. So it shifts the brain chemistry to be regulated. Now when it comes to antidepressants, it's the opposite. So usually it's an absence or a decreased amount of serotonin or norepinephrine. It's one of the two usually that's the cause of depression and so serotonin is the most widely known so we'll use that as an example with depression it's it's a disparity of serotonin so instead of all these serotonin people waiting outside the club and the bouncers not letting anyone in when you take an antidepressant now you have another bouncer there that's like hey bouncer why, why aren't you letting these people in we're not making any money let all these people in or let more in so that's the <laughs> I love that example just because a lot of people can understand it and I think one of my classes actually explained it like that so that's kind of how medication works I know for me in my journey with mental health you know usually they do prescribe you meds and sometimes medication is the answer and sometimes it's not and it really depends on the person honestly and it depends on what the causation is if it's mainly like your cognitive and behavioral thinking which can shift the brain chemistry, then usually therapy of working on those cognitive and behavioral factors can shift it back to being regulated. But if your receptors, if it's like biological where your brain receptors are just out of whack for some reason, then medication is going to help. And we'll talk about this in one of our later cases in this episode where one of the success stories of someone with schizophrenia, he talks about how he was on medication and then he eventually didn't have to be on it anymore. So sometimes medication is only good for a time because it regulates it up until it needs to be. And if all of the other factors are changing, then you might not have to be on it. 
But anyways, I, that always interests me. I love, I, when I, like I said, whenever I was first prescribed medicine for my condition, I, I was interested in knowing, well, how, how does this work and why my intro to psychology class answered that question because we went over the brain. A lot of times when we hear about schizophrenia, it's not positive. We typically associate it with like insane people and negative things and and violence, but violence is actually not even a symptom of schizophrenia. However, we are going to talk about one case, one real life case that happened and it is, it's very sad. And I will give warning, it is pretty gruesome some and it is pretty graphic. I will try to keep details at a minimum because that's not really the point that I'm trying to get at here, but we will dive into this case. And I do want to give credit. I want to give a quick shout out. I have two friends that are in Canada and I actually became friends with them because they have a true crime podcast that I love and I listen to all the time. I first started listening to it and I'm I'm picky when it comes to podcasts, when it comes to listening to them. And these two, they are just amazing. They are so down to earth and they make you feel like you are there in the room with them and they kind of make you feel like you can be their best friend. So I just want to give a shout out to them. If you ever want to check out a more detailed account, they do, I think it's their second episode where they talk about this specific case, but I want to give them a shout out because I got a lot of my details from their podcast and I did some digging myself, but I was lazy and I already listened to their episodes. So I'm like, you know, why not? <laughs> Nicole and Ben, you guys are amazing. Their podcast is called Wicked and Grim. And I believe they're on like, I know they're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. They're probably on all major platforms. They're amazing. They're Canadian and they're just so down to earth and I love them. So thank you guys so much. Now let's get into this case. Now this case is typically called the Greyhound Bus beheading or the Greyhound bus murder. So I'm going to give a little bit of background here. On July 30th, 2008, 22-year-old Tim McLean was returning home to Winnipeg after working at a fair in Edmonton in Canada. He was actually a carnival worker and he made a decent amount of money. And he was actually, it was like his last stop, his last fair that he was working at because he was actually moving to British Columbia. Now he enjoyed motorcycles, He enjoyed sports, and he pretty much made friends wherever he went. He was a happy-go-lucky guy from everything that I've heard about him. But on on July 30th, 2008, he boarded bus number 1170. Now, another guy named Vince Lee, he's a 40-year-old immigrant from China. So, he immigrated from China to Canada. So, in 2005, three years prior to this incident, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. However, he didn't take his medication for it. He pretty much left it untreated. Now, he at this time was job hopping and currently was in a paper delivery type of job and he was going to Winnipeg for a job interview. Now, on his way to the bus station, he went to a hardware store and he bought a large hunting knife. Now, he did this because God told him, your life is in danger, people are trying to kill you, and you need protection. So there's hallucination and a delusion right there. Because one, he's saying a voice told him that, and it's a delusion that people are trying to kill him. Now, the day before, on July 20th, he boarded a bus, and during one of the stops in Alberta, Canada, he stayed the night there, and he actually slept on a bench at the bus stop because God told him to. So, he was supposed to travel all through the night to Winnipeg on the 20th, but instead, he he stopped and slept on a bench and waited for a voice or for what he was claiming God to tell him what to do next. But 24 hours later, the voice never told him anything. So on July 30th, he boarded bus 1170 to head to Winnipeg. Now a little background on this bus, all right? It is a Greyhound bus and about 60 people they can fit on here. And it wasn't full when he boarded or when this happened. So it wasn't full. And he first sat in one of like the front front seats. Now on one of the stops, he, mo- he kept moving seats and he ended up sitting next to Tim 
McLean, which is the 22 year old we talked about first. Now passengers, they noticed that Vince was showing some odd behavior. He was rocking back and forth and chanting and muttering in another language. A lot of really weird stuff, like not normal. Now when he sat next to Tim, I've heard different reports on this that maybe Tim said, hi, how are you doing? And then I've heard other reports of him trying to sleep next to him, just like trying to sleep with his earbuds in. I kind of think maybe both happened (laughs) because Tim seemed like a very friendly guy. So maybe he said, hi, nice to meet you. And then maybe he went and tried to sleep. At 8.30 p.m., a voice told Vince, the man next to you has to die. Deep breath, because this is where it's going to get kind of gruesome. Witnesses say that they saw Vince reach into his bag and pull out the knife that he purchased and he began to attack Tim, stabbing him repeatedly. And I mean repeatedly, not just like a quick stab, like he would not stop. So while this was happening, witnesses screamed, stop the bus, stop the bus, because they were en route at this point. And so the bus pulled over and they, the passengers evacuated as fast as they could. Now by the time everyone was off the bus, there were like up to like 60 to 80 stab wounds on Tim. And later reports, I guess autopsy, showed that Tim did have defensive wounds on his hands. So he did try to fight. He, he tried to fight for his life. So at that point, Vince, he tried to leave the bus. But the driver, one passenger, and a passerby, they held the door closed so he couldn't get out. And so what did Vince do? Well, he turned around, went back to Tim's body, and he started to mutilate the body further. So he mutilated it to the point where he decapitated the head and then he walked towards the front of the bus and placed it down on the ground. And then he tried to get off the bus again, but you know, those three guys had the door held to where he couldn't get out. Well, then he tried to drive the bus away, but he couldn't. Thank goodness. But then what happened? He went back to Tim's body and he started to mutilate it further and he claimed later on that a voice in his head said that if he didn't like mutilate the body further that Tim's body would come alive again and kill him. So there's another hallucination and delusion. Now I will say at one point during all of this like Tim wasn't just left for dead. There was a one passenger or it might have been the bus driver at one point after everyone evacuated came back on the bus to check if Tim was still alive like if there was anything that they could do but by that time he was dead and with Vince just going ham on him like there was no way that they could have saved him and the witness that came on the bus did report that when Vince was attacking Tim like it's like very robotic like he was very robotic and it just was not normal like it wasn't rage it was I don't know how else to explain how they explained it so police they did arrive on the scene and they barricaded the bus but there was a long standoff it was like five hours long and the officers on the scene they did try to communicate with Vince but the only reports said that Vince kept yelling I must stay on this bus forever so I don't know if that was just another thing that the voices were telling him to do. During the standoff, Vince just continued to mutilate and decapitate Tim's body and he carried pieces of body parts across the bus and he was even seen cannibalizing the body. Now at 1.20 a.m. the next day, 31 July, Vince, he tried to escape through a window but he was quickly tased and apprehended by the police. And in his pocket, he had a bag with some of Tim's body parts. Now when they went to, I guess, clear the scene and look at everything, Tim's body had like a hundred stabs, gashes, and gaping wounds. But later on, Vince claimed that he doesn't recall eating any of the body parts. And unfortunately, at court and everything, and once Vince was apprehended, and I guess once he came back to came out of his psychosis episode his psychotic episode all he could say was please kill me so now on to the trial the trial was only two days long and the two main witnesses were psychologists and on 5 march 2009 the trial ended vince was deemed not criminally responsible due to mental illness and untreated schizophrenia. This means that whatever time he was going to serve, which would be in a mental facility, when he got released, if he got released, 
he would have no criminal record. So there's a lot of controversy around that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Now, he was placed in a mental facility and treated with medication. And luckily, he had no further episodes. In February 2014, which is about five years later, he was granted unescorted trips to a nearby city for about 30 minutes. Now, there were two things. They had to make sure that he was taking his meds and he had to have a cell phone on him for communication. So, as time went on, his time on these trips, they started to increase. So, then it was like, oh, okay, 30 minutes. And then the next time, it's like, okay, now you can be in the city for like an hour. And then, you know, it eventually became, okay, you can spend a full day and so on and so forth. They were pretty much weaving him out of the facility and and they were seeing how well he could be in public and I guess they could account for if he was still a, a danger or not. And with him being on the meds, he wasn't showing any signs. He had no further episodes. Now, <laughs> in February of 2017, which is eight years after the incident, he was Fully discharged. So, fully discharged, no criminal record, and he changed his name, and he's now known as Will Baker, Will Lee Baker. Chris Somerville, he's with the Manitoba Schizophrenia Society. He's on the side of the debate for his release. He actually advocated for it. He regularly chats with Baker and kept in close contact ever since the decision of his release came down. And these are quotes from him. He continues to make excellent progress. He's doing as well as anyone I know with schizophrenia and I know that's hard for many people in the public to understand. He, Like I said, he's been an outspoken supporter of Baker and his release for years. Now on the other hand, the victim's mother has came out and reasonably so have said how do we know he's not going to be a danger to the public? How do we know that he's going to take his medications? But Somerville has also kind of rebuted that saying, well, I think it's because he feels so guilty for what did happen. It's like his guilt. So he knows what could happen. So he's going to take his meds. So before we get into anything else, we just got to reflect on this for a little bit. Now remember, three years before the incident happened, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he did not take his meds. He left it untreated himself. So even though during this episode, he was not mentally in his right mind, should he still be held accountable because he left his condition untreated? treated? Should he do any criminal time for that? Or should whatever criminal time he would get in his right mind, should he have to spend that in a mental facility? I don't know, just something to think about. I'm, I'm not really going to say kind of where I stand, but because these are very sticky situations when people do plead insanity and they are actually found insane or they, they were having some type of episode, it's hard to really judge what should happen to that person when it comes to criminal charges, right? And I guess people can argue that, but on the other hand, you also have people that try to plea insanity and they're not insane. They're just evil. And luckily, we have psychologists that evaluate these people and can make those decisions and can advocate or not advocate for their conditions. However, just a quick Google search or listening to my podcast can tell you what these symptoms of these are. Nowadays, with the excess amount of information it's it's too easy it can be too easy but with in this guy's case he was diagnosed with a mental disorder before the incident happened so that also plays into it being a little bit differently with his plea of insanity but just something to think and reflect on now, the next disorder we're going to talk about is schizoaffective disorder. We're not going to dive too much into this one because it's a mix of schizophrenic disorder and also bipolar disorder. And bipolar disorder is a mood disorder that we will cover in another episode. But it's a combination of the two. And in addition to the symptoms that are associated with those conditions, someone with this mental health issue, they might have incoherent speech, bizarre behavior, trouble functioning at work, school, or in social situations, and problems with grooming. So the next condition we're going to talk about is called a brief psychotic disorder. Now I brought up the word psychosis earlier 
and I didn't really explain that too much. I'm sorry. Psychosis is used as another word for having a psychotic episode. And a psychotic episode goes into any type of psychotic disorder when they have an episode. And for example, like in the last story that I I told you about with Vince, he's diagnosed with schizophrenia. But when that incident happened, he was having a psychotic episode or he was it was during psychosis so i hope that kind of makes more sense now now with brief psychotic disorder if someone is under extreme stress the development of brief psychotic disorder can occur very rapidly it's a temporary mental health problem but it can have intense symptoms including hallucinations and delusions although returning to normal functioning shortly afterward the time when having psychotic symptoms can be dangerous to the person experiencing it and others around them and just because people have a psychotic episode with any condition like i said it it doesn't always have to be violent it, and it typically isn't and we're, we're we're going to shed the positive light on this i wanted to get the bad out first and then we'll go over a few people and cases where they weren't violent at all so don't worry i i like to sprinkle in the butterflies and rainbows and unicorns at the end <laughs> so with brief psychotic disorder i have a good example for you guys and it's from criminal minds which i love that show it's just incredible I and mean, you learn so much from that show but it also helps to do some studying too because they reference a lot of other cases and other people in real life situations and you'll hear them say different words but they don't always fully explain what those words are So that's why I'm here. So in this episode, it's titled True Night. Now the main character is played by Frankie Muniz, which, oh my gosh, that just brings me back. I'm going to talk about Frankie Muniz for like a few minutes. Or not even minutes, but a few seconds. Growing up, he was like heartthrob. He was in Big Fat Liar and Malcolm in the Middle. And I think he was even on Lizzie McGuire, like in a few episodes or something. But yeah, growing up, I remember watching him in movies and stuff. But anyways, (laughs) sorry, fangirling a little bit. He plays in this episode, a guy named Johnny McHale, who is an artist and comic book writer. Now He's got a comic book series called Blue, and it's about like robotic type of superhero type thing i yeah i don't know it's pretty light-hearted and more like technological type of series he was in i believe in a cab with his girlfriend and she told him that she was pregnant and then they they got out of the cab and they were walking home or something and so he proposed to her and while he was proposing to her they were confronted by a gang and they started to mock him and the girlfriend and her name is vicky in, in this and they're like you know you should accept his proposal and they're making fun of him and they pretty much tortured her to death in front of him and then they sliced him in the stomach and left him for dead luckily he was found on the street and admitted to the hospital but unfortunately vicky died now when he was at the hospital he was diagnosed with ptsd so about six months later after the incident at night he started to have psychotic episodes and he started to go after and kill members of the gang and he wrote and drew these events Vince for a new comic book series called True Night, but he thought he was just dreaming all of this up. And this happens throughout the episode. It happens many times where at, he goes at night and kills a gang member, and then he draws up the whole thing. And the whole True Night character is like this hooded superhero slash villain taking vengeance on these other criminals. Now, at one point in the episode, he's actually in the vehicle with his agent, who convinced him that we have a comic book signing. You need to go. I haven't heard from you in days. What's going on? And they pass by a crime scene, which is actually one of the crimes he committed the night before. But of course, he doesn't remember. And he started talking to his agent about his girlfriend. And he's like, you know, I've been trying to call her and I can't reach her. And I just keep getting her voicemail. And his agent is just like, what the heck is going on? Because, you know, she died six months ago. And so they go to the comic book signing and all the fans and the flashes from the cameras. It pretty much makes him break into another psychotic episode. So then he goes and he kills like the gang leader. And then he goes and trashes his apartment. And then he tries to call his girlfriend again, and he only gets her voicemail. Now, at this time, the FBI, they break into his apartment, and they arrest him, and 
They're saying, you know, you're charged for these murders. And he says he's not the killer, that he only has, like, vague recollection of the events and that it's only part of his comic book thing and he's dreaming these things. But once they get him in the interrogation room, the FBI, they present him with evidence of the girlfriend's death, mug shots of the gang leader, crime scene photos, and his comic book stuff because when they broke into his apartment, they found all his drawings and stuff about the true night. At that point, he started to remember everything and or he I guess it, it dawned on him that he really did commit these horrific crimes so the episode ends with him in a hospital and he's drawing pictures of his girlfriend and calling her phone to listen to her voice so long story short he was pretty much having brief he brief psychotic disorder. He kept going into these psychotic episodes. He didn't remember anything. He thought he dreamed up the whole thing. And, you know, really it was just because of the traumatic event that happened that was the onset of this disorder. Okay, deep breath. <sighs> Now we're going to talk about the positive. I'm going to talk about two people that have been diagnosed with schizophrenia that, I mean, there's no record of violence or anything negative at all. I mean, and typically there's not. So, I just want to show that the distorted perception that we have on schizophrenia is usually not the case. And that usually these people, they just need help. They just need treatment. They're dealing with these issues, with this illness, and that's pretty much all it is. It's usually not a violent type of thing. So I hope we have some sports fans tuning in, especially if you are if you are older. You will probably recognize the name of this player. His name is Lionel Aldridge. He played 11 seasons from 19... 1963 to 1973. He was a defense tackle and he played for the Green Bay Packers the majority of his career and then he played for the Chargers like the last few years. He is a Hall of Famer and he actually was the first NFL player to marry interracially which is really cool. Now let me think of how I'm going to start this out. So following his amazing football career, he moved behind the microphone as a sports broadcaster, working as an analyst for such stations like MTMJ, as well as nationally for NBC. Throughout those years, he didn't show any signs of schizophrenia. And he was actually diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, which just means that extra paranoia is a symptom. But things, they started to change. This is a quote from him. So, and and of course, now he's, unfortunately now he has passed, but from this article that I got, I'm going to read quotes from him. So, I really didn't start getting sick until I was about 33. He was saying, he said this at age 56. I was working full time at WTMJ at the time and things just started to fall apart. There was extreme paranoia and irritability and it was difficult for me to get along with others. I was unable to work. It was a rough setting. So, he would eventually go through a divorce before leaving military. Milwaukee to travel throughout the country but he was homeless from 1982 to 1984 and then for a short time a few years later he just lived day to day to survive. So he eventually returned to Milwaukee where with the help of friends he sought treatment for his illness and started down the road to recovery. Here's another quote from him. I didn't consider myself a drifter I was just a victim of schizophrenia and he actually lost both of his Super Bowl rings while he was homeless unfortunately. I had gone 10 years without getting any kind of treatment. Once I accepted and cooperated with the treatment, I started to beat the illness. So he has spoke about his battle since around 1987. And originally he started to give programs and talks to keep himself on the full path to recovery because he felt like talking about his illness would help him conquer it. Now, at one point, he was completely healed due to treatment and therapy and everything, and he started just speaking to help people that were going through what they were going through. Another quote from him, speaking to groups has changed for me. When I started, I did it as a way to keep myself stable, but once I got well, it serves as a way to get the information out. So, letting people hear about paranoid schizophrenia, it's not the only reason why he could continue to speak about the illness. He also discussed how he got through it and what he used in his battle against the mental illness. 
he said that there are many ways, in addition to medication, to get through the illness that people suffering from the disease they may not know about. Another quote from him, My accomplishment is that people are hearing what can be done. People can and do recover from mental illness. The medication is important, but it doesn't cure you. I want the things I did to help myself and people who may be suffering now or people who may know someone who is suffering can hear that. It's something that has been very well received and people seem to want to hear about it wherever I go. It's exciting for me. So at the time when he was retired, he spent a lot of his time traveling and talking and giving programs about paranoid schizophrenia and how he lived through it. And at that time, he was he was quoted to say that he is happy and healthy and spending you know after spending almost one third of his life fighting mental illness he's ready to just enjoy life another quote he said was i think my life is real normal right now i feel blessed i can pay the bills and be happy and i don't have the responsibilities of a regular job all i'm doing is being retired i think it's heaven and another quote that he did say he said, I'm completely symptom free. I have no reminders of my illness. Giving programs like these, you know, when he's speaking to others, are like therapy for me. I have this satisfaction of saying, been there, done that. Now, unfortunately, he did pass away February 12th. 1998 but what what a guy and i don't want to say because he had like concussions and stuff if that's what the cause i mean it's possible but what a story i mean this guy went from being you know hall of famer successful and he was just battling mental illness retired homeless for a little bit just because he couldn't function and then he had people step into his life and help him now another person that i want to talk about is john nash and i don't know if you've ever heard about him but he he is a mathematician, right? What an amazing subject. <laughs> Can't we all agree? Who else loves math? I can get up to algebra and anything past that. It's like, no, mm -mm, can't do it. John Nash, his struggles with his illness and his recovery actually became the basis for Sylvia Nazer's biography, A Beautiful Mind. And there's also a film of the same title and it stars Russell Crowe portraying him. So Nash, he developed symptoms of schizophrenia in the late 50s when he was around age 30. Now this was after he made groundbreaking contributions to the field of mathematics including the extension of game theory or the math of decision making so his contributions also include differential geometry the study of partial differential equations his work has provided insight into the factors that govern chance and decision making inside complex systems found in everyday life his theories are very widely used in economics so pretty much any math class you take a lot of his work has been the groundwork for those things, which is really cool. So he served as a senior research mathematician at Princeton University during the latter part of his life. He shared the 1994 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences with game theorists Reiner, Reiner Selton and John Harsanyi. In 2015, he also shared the Abel Prize with Louis Nirenberg for his work on nonlinear partial differential equations. So John Nash, he is actually the only person to be awarded both the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economical Sciences and the Abel Prize. In 1959, he began to show clear signs of mental illness. This is way before he won some of these awards, guys. It really shows you a big success story here. Um, he spent several years at psychiatric hospitals being treated for schizophrenia. So he began to exhibit bizarre behavior and experience paranoia and delusions. And over the next several decades, he was hospitalized many times and he was on and off of psychotic medications. So after 1970, his condition started to improve and it allowed him to return to academic work by the mid-1980s. During his first hospital visit, they were emerging from old tactics of treating these type of conditions. So like electric shock therapy and insulin shock therapy, they were now shifting to antipsychotic medications. So this was groundbreaking. And the way that I described how medications work earlier, I mean, they just, the first one came out around this time. And then even later, another type came out, which worked even better. 
So in the 1980s, when he was in his 50s, his condition did begin to improve. And in an email to a colleague in the mid-1990s, this is what Nash said. I emerged from irrational thinking ultimately without medicine other than the natural hormonal changes of aging. This was according to the New York Times. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because I was reading up on this. And so he was taking medications, but then whenever he started to have like a hallucination or delusion with his intelligent mind he started to question it and he started to evaluate it so he was then able to know if the delusion or the hallucination was real or not and with with that thinking it started to shift where he would take it as something to believe or not to believe. So studies done in the 1930s, this was before medications were even available, they found that about 20% of patients recovered on their own, while 80% did not. This was said by Dr. Gilda Marino, who is a clinical psychologist at Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. So more recent studies have found that with treatment, like with medications, that up to 60% of schizophrenia patients can and achieve remission while researchers they define as having minimal symptoms for at least six months and this is according to a 2010 review study in the journal advances in psychiatric treatment so it's not clear why only some schizophrenia patients get better but researchers they do know that a number of factors are linked with better outcomes and guess what Nash he appeared to have many of those factors in place and it's kind of wicked because the things that cause schizophrenia can be the same things to help cure schizophrenia. So the anecdote becomes the same thing that caused it in a way, just in an opposite roundabout way. So I'll go more into this here. So not only having medication to offset the biological aspect, when you have supportive people, so social factors such as having a job, supportive community, and a family that's able to help, that links with better outcomes for schizophrenia patients. So even though you could have a bad social environment as a child that could cause the onset of this, later on having a supportive community can help with the cure. So it's kind of funny how the opposite interaction can help. I mean, it clearly makes sense, but it took a lot of research and studies to actually know that for sure those things can help. Now, people who have a later onset of the disease, they tend to do better than those who experience their first episode of psychosis in their teens. I kind of brought that up earlier. So like I said, psychosis is like referring to losing touch with the reality. That's when you're having like an episode. So Nash, he was 30 years old when he started to experience the symptoms of schizophrenia. So having that later on that later onset also helped him. Now he also had supportive colleagues who helped him find jobs where people were very protective of him. He had a wife who cared for him and even after they divorced she took him back into his house so he wouldn't be homeless. Like they became, they were still like really close. They were still good friends. And so he had a lot of protective factors that helped him with his outcome. Now him and his wife or ex-wife, Alicia, they passed away at ages 86 and 82 in a car crash on the New Jersey Turnpike while en route home from when he was awarded that 2015 Abel Prize, which is kind of sad. But he was 86, you guys. He lived a long life. He made many mathematical discoveries, and no matter how much we may hate math, like his stuff is groundbreaking and still used today. And what we learn about math, when it, if you ever go out gambling, like that probability and chance and game theory he created all that so you can thank him <laughs> so even though he had a later onset and developed this in his 30s when he was about in his 50s he was doing much better and he overcame this so I just think it's incredible and the work he did even after that and the awards he won and the discoveries he made it's just incredible and just like him and Anne Lionel Aldridge that is usually the case you guys usually these people and it's like with any mental disorder 
disorder. These people, they just need help, really. They need love, care, maybe medication. And it's hard. It's it's really hard. And a lot of people struggle from mental illness. So I just want to shred a positive, a more positive light and try to shift the stigma that we as a culture have previously had on mental health. And I think that education and information and knowing more about these things definitely help. Won't you agree? Well, I hope you learned a lot from this episode. I know I did diving into these. I know I learned a lot about two incredible people, Lionel and John, who did amazing things, even with these conditions. And I hope that you have that more positive outlook, too. While some mental disorders can be more dangerous, you know, per se, dependent on the person, dependent on the severity of delusions, hallucinations, whatever. We must know that the majority aren't those negative cases. So, let me know what you think. Send me an email at wtpsychology at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at wtpsychology. Send us a tweet at wtpsychology. Share us on Instagram at whatthepsychology. Listen to us on any podcast podcast platform that you want to but our host platform is anchor and that you can find us on anchor.fm backslash wt psychology like us share us tell your friends tell your family tell your grandma tell your creepy neighbor i don't care just get the word out about this I'm really excited and I am really proud and I'm really happy and I'm really grateful for your support and I hope that I can just keep producing content that you guys enjoy. And reflect on some of the things we talked about today and let me know what you think. Give me suggestions and ideas. I'm your host, Kay Gonzalez, and you've been listening to What the Psychology. Stay psyched, y'all.